Peter is Arunas Laskowskis. He's from the Upper Great Lakes Management Unit uh, for, well, for the Upper Great Lakes. Uh, they said Owen Sound. Uh, I got to know Arunas about, I'm going to say, I think we're closing on 15 years ago as part of the uh, Lake Huron Initiative for Community Action. Um, uh, we were kind of getting together around some ideas around how we derive uh, local level community actions based on the science and research that was happening uh, across the lakes. Um, I would say that among the other speakers we've had, Arunas is, uh, is an incredible presenter. Uh, he's much sought after. He's been filmed. This is like just speaking, building this guy up. Um, he's, he's been filmed so that we can share the presentation with lo uh, local schools. Um, and uh, the other thing I can say is that I had the pleasure to do a, a sea kayak trip with, with him this past summer. Is he, uh, he does a mean sh uh, shore lunch or a shore dinner of, uh, of fish. Um, so, Arunas, thanks again for joining us uh, and sharing your knowledge with us. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invite, and thank you for this opportunity to talk about Georgian Bay fish. I speak to you with respect and humility because I'm going to give you one version of a fish story and we all have fish stories and they are all accurate to a certain extent. <laughs> I'm going to try to use 25 plus years of working with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry on Lake Huron, and over that time I have gathered some insights about fish community dynamics, but I can freely admit that there's still a lot that I don't know about fish. So I'm going to give you some information and I'm going to try to compile it in a way that uh, will help you appreciate some of the significant changes that have occurred, particularly in the last 10 to 15 years, and how the fish community has been restructuring, and how in many cases it's leading to a lot of uncertainty moving forward in terms of what we can expect, expect from our fish communities in the future. So as soon as I figure out how to use the device. How do I advance? Use the arrow. Use the arrow. arrow. If in doubt, use the arrow. And there we go. So I'm going to provide you with an outline of my presentation. I'm going to highlight some information that we collect from our offshore index surveys. Um, these offshore index surveys use graded mesh yield nets to characterize the offshore fish community. So we're looking at fish small and large that are susceptible to the gill nets that we used. Uh, food web monitoring. Our unit doesn't necessarily monitor the food web, the, the prey base, but we do have our counterparts in Michigan, uh, the U.S. Geological Survey that does uh, trawling and hydroacoustics, and we gain insights on the dynamics of prey fish using their data. We conduct extensive surveys in the near shore to try to characterize the near shore fish community using a variety of different survey types. We also incorporate a small fish survey. Our typical nets don't capture a lot of the small species that uh, reside in the near shore areas. So the small fish survey uses uh, uh, nets that capture juveniles and all those minnows that you see in shore. We also conduct spawning surveys, so these are spawning runs of adult fish of a variety of species to gain insights into the current status of the spawning populations. And I'm going to have to restrict my presentation to selected case studies because apparently I'm only being given 40 minutes to totally describe fish community dynamics on the lake. And that's not really possible to go into detail with all of the different survey areas that we cover. So I'm going to just highlight a few areas, and if you have specific questions on specific areas in Georgian Bay, 
feel free to approach me after my talk. So, just a little bit of insight into our offshore index survey. You can see on the map the locations that we have surveyed over the years. Some of them are done on an annual basis and some of them are done intermittently. Some of the areas have been sampled since the late 1970s. There are a few areas like the watchers that we do intermittently. The last time it was done in 2017. But these surveys try to give us an indication of what's happening with the offshore deep water fish communities. So I'm only going to highlight one area, that being Cape Rich, and that's in the southern part of Georgian Bay. I guess I must have a point or two, do I? Yeah. Center. Center. Cape Rich. Cape Rich. <laughs> right there. I'm going to focus on a couple species in particular. And uh, our previous speakers mentioned some of these species. A lake whitefish, a benthiferous fish, feeds on the bottom of cultural significance to indigenous communities and to other communities, economically very significant, socially very significant, and spiritually as well. Lake trout as well will be profiled and it's significant for the same reasons as well as ecologically. It's considered a keystone predator and it has the capacity to structure fish communities by its predation on other fish species. And these two species have been found in abundance post-glaciation and up until a couple hundred years ago. And now we are entering into an era in which, based on current population traje traje trajectories, their future is very uncertain. So I'm just going to provide you with some insights into what we are seeing at the Cape Ridge area for whitefish. This graph depicts the average catch of lake whitefish in our gillnet sets. And you can see that since 2005, the abundance of lake whitefish in this area has diminished quite substantially. And the reasons are not all clear, but it comes coincidentally with the proliferation of coagulum mussels and the decline, declining levels of nutrients and phytoplankton in the water column. I should also point out that Cape Rich historically was considered one of the largest spawning and juvenile areas for lake whitefish across all the Great Lakes. And it's an area that currently we have very little information on how those spawning reefs, those spawning shoals are actually functioning. Uh, that hard rocky substrate is susceptible to colonization by quag mussels. Uh, we know that that Collingwood, Southern Georgian Bay area is undergoing a lot of development pressure, a lot of shoreline hardening. There's a lot of rocky groins along the shoreline that affect currents. Uh, when whitefish hatch, they're very passive and they just basically go with the prevailing currents. So there's been a lot of alteration to a lot of their early life history environment. And for those of you who travel along Highway 26 in that area, we'll observe after heavy rains, there's quite a sediment plume that discharges into Nautilusaga Bay. We don't really have currently a critical evaluation of how the spawning habitat in this area is functioning. And there are a lot of unanswered questions about what is happening to Lake Whitefish. Additional evidence that this species is not doing very well in the Cape Ridge area. This is a graph showing the relative abundance of juvenile stages of whitefish. This is a pre-recruit index. So these are the small whitefish that we typically catch in our gill nets. The, there are ages one to three. And you can get a general idea of how successful natural reproduction has been 
when you compile the catch rate of juveniles aged 1 to 3. And in this graph, you can see that since the early 2000s, there has been very little evidence of naturally reproduced whitefish in this area. So they are not successfully reproducing. And we're not quite sure why. Is it the lack of adults? Is it the environment that the eggs are finding themselves in? Are the prevailing winds that are intensifying in speed, creating turbulence in the near shore? There's a lot of unanswered questions. But whitefish are just not doing very well in this area. If we look at lake trout in the Cape Rich area, they also underwent a substantial decline in the early 2000s, coincident with the proliferation of quag mussels and reduced abundance of nutrients and plankton in the water column. But you can see that in recent years, there's actually been a slight increase in the abundance, particularly of adult lake trout in the Cape Rich area. And we're starting to see evidence of natural reproduction of lake trout spawning in this particular part of the lake. Now I just wanted to backtrack a bit, just to provide a bit more context as to how we got to where we are right now. And whitefish and lake trout in particular were affected by changes to the fish community in the Great Lakes that happened quite some time ago. In the 30s and 40s, we had what I like to refer to as the first wave of invasive species entering into the Great Lakes. And many of you know these characters, the rainbow smelt and the alewife and the sea lamprey. The sea lamprey in particular had a profound impact on fish community dynamics. And this is evidenced by the extreme reduced harvest of lake trout in the historic commercial fishery on the lake. This is some of our, I guess, longest time trend data for this species. And you can see that with the onset of sea lamprey in the early 1930s, there was a catastrophic decline in the harvest of lake trout. And you can see that since then, uh, we've been engaged in efforts to try to rehabilitate this native apex predator into the lake with variable success. And I'm going to expand upon that a little later in my talk. You can see that the current abundance is quite low and the commercial harvest isn't really reflective of the current abundance of lake trout in the lake. When we look at Lake Whitefish, you know, I could probably spend a day describing the graph that you see in front of you but I don't have a day. So I'm just going to quickly let you know that sea lamprey impacted whitefish quite dramatically as well as lake trout. And you can see that by the early 1930s there was a dramatic decline in lake whitefish abundance. And then you can see that their abundance fluctuated quite dramatically. In fact, most of that harvest was coming out of Georgian Bay. And it was related to the expansion of rainbow smelt and alewife and how that affected other pelagic prey fish. And then you see that since the 1970s, there was a gradual increase in the abundance of lake whitefish. In fact, they reached beyond historical levels by the early 2000s, in the late 1990s. So whitefish, without any management assistance, they were recruiting, they were reproducing successfully, and that was primarily driven by the reduced presence of sea lamprey. So adult whitefish were able to spawn and reproduce. Now you might be wondering, like, why didn't lake trout reproduce during this period of time? That's the complex part of the story. Lake trout were consuming alewives, which did not enable them to reproduce successfully. I don't have time to go into that story today. If that weren't complicated enough, I'm trying to get a gauge of time. I'm halfway through? 33 left. 33 left? Not even halfway, okay, that's good, so I won't panic. So if that weren't complicated enough, we also have further assaults on the ecology of the lake. And I like to refer to this phase as the second wave of invasives. 
Now, I don't have a copyright on this terminology, so don't quote me on that. But we have the second phase of invasives that include the zebra and coagula muscles, the round goby, the spiny water flea. And you've heard about the consequences of these invasive species when they entered the ecology of Lake Huron. It's predominantly negative impacts on the recipient waters. You've already seen this slide, so I don't even have to expand upon it. Coagula mussels expanding and really wreaking havoc on the ecology of the lake. Dipariah, I'm going to re-emphasize this point. Very important food component for a whole spectrum of fish species. High in lipids, used to be found in quite high abundance. I like to use this descriptive analogy that this round table here at the front would likely contain tens of thousands of individuals Dipraia, that fish would feed on, and now they're absent. So the replacement of that prey base has been coagula zebra mussels. Don't nearly have the nutritional qualities of Dipraia. So there's been a lot of alterations to the offshore fish community and extending to the lower food web. This is a graph showing the abundance of prey fish from the 1970s, when you had an overabundance of rainbow smelt and alewife that were not native to Lake Huron or the Great Lakes, were introduced in one capacity as a result of stocking an inland lake in Michigan, that was the rainbow smelt, and the alewife made its way up the St. Lawrence Seaway, the Welland Canal, and into the rest of the Great Lakes. And you can see that their abundance throughout the 80s and 90s was quite high. And that precipitated a management response which was to introduce non-native predators into the lake, which included Chinook salmon, coho salmon, rainbow trout. Primary reason for that was to try to control this overabundance of non-native prey fish. And you can see that I've highlighted the smelt and the alewife. The alewife are the darker colors, the black and the grays, and the smelt are the blue and the green, sorry, the blue, shades of blue, light blue. Uh, the take home message here is that from 2003 onwards, we saw a collapse in alewife populations and to a lesser extent, rainbow smelt. So we have a very much reduced prey base in the offshore waters of Lake Huron. However, we're starting to see some um, positive signals of our native prey fish, like the bloater chub, which is a cisco species that occupies the deep offshore waters of the lake. And it has responded in a relatively positive way to the current conditions on the lake but currently it's not being utilized as a prey fish by a lot of predators. Possibly because of its distribution in the deeper depths, it may not be as accessible as the remnant populations of smelt and alewife that still exist in the offshore waters. But there's been a dramatic decline in the abundance of prey, and therefore fewer predators can be supported by the lake currently. And you can see up at the top I've got round goby in red. And you don't see round goby on this graph. Round goby are likely the most abundant prey item in the lake right now, but they are very difficult to sample. They tend to occupy areas that are not conducive to the data that's been used to generate this graph. This is trawling data, data or trawling nets that go along the bottom and capture fish species that are near the bottom. Most of the gobies are inhabiting rocky substrates and they're not, you can't run a trawl through rocky substrates because it'll tear your nets apart. So that's an area of inquiry that we have a lot of insights to gain. We don't know how abundant goby are in the offshore waters because we haven't 
effectively sand with them. But based upon some of the diet work that's been done, ground goby are now a primary diet item in the diets of not only predators, but we're also seeing them in the diets of lake whitefish. Whitefish are, are consuming young of the year goby that are found near the bottom of the lake. Just to hammer home my point about how fish communities have been restructured in the offshore, this is the Cape Rich Index. I mentioned that it goes back to 1979. I've marked the onset of zebra mussels and then coagula mussels. And you can see that since the early 2000s, not only lake whitefish and lake trout have declined in abundance, but all the other species that we used to encounter. So the sucklers, the burbot, um, gizzard shad, lake chub, all species have declined dramatically in abundance because the lower food web just cannot support the diversity and numbers of fish that it once did. Who's responsible for this? Is there any accountability? Invasive species are now in our midst. And this is one of the follows of that invasive species colonization. These are the dramatic results that we're seeing in the lake. And as a biologist, I'm supposed to take a neutral stand and just be an observer. But this is creating a lot of hardship for a lot of communities. We're trying to gain insights as to what is happening that is uh, not allowing whitefish to recruit. We've just started some research into that early life history bottleneck, and uh, we're looking at the presence of larval whitefish in inshore areas. Uh, we're concentrating our efforts uh, in the fishing islands in the main basin of Lake Huron and trying to get some insights as to where are these whitefish not surviving. Is it at the egg stage? Is it larvae? Is it the young of the year or beyond that? So that work is still a work in progress. We're seeing some positive developments on the lake trout front. They are reproducing. They're being found in larger and greater abundance. We're seeing adult-sized lake trout where we hadn't seen them in years past. This is just an example of a recent survey in Ottawa-Saga Bay where we're seeing wild-produced fish and fish that are growing to, are persisting up to 18 years of age. So that's something that we haven't seen in a long time. And I thought I'd better highlight the Perry Sound lake trout story while I'm here. This is a population of lake trout, the only population that has been rehabilitated outside of Lake Superior. And it's a success story. There's a map on, uh, would it be your right hand side, that shows all these different shaded areas. For those of you who are lake trout fishermen, you'll know that these are all special regulations that uh, try to regulate the harvest of lake trout. It's very difficult to protect lake trout from overexploitation. You have to kind of go to extreme lengths to enable them to persist. They're along their species, they don't reproduce until an older age, and it's difficult, and they can't take a lot of harvest. So in Perry Sound, we're seeing good signs of natural reproduction, lots of juveniles being produced, and we're seeing a wide range of age classes. So that population is actually doing quite well uh, in the context of what I've just described. So, do I have time for the near shore? You're at half time. I'm at half time, so I'll pay equal billing to the offshore and the near shore. But take home message, offshore fish communities, highly altered and reduced productivity. Now we'll switch to the near shore. And this map just gives you an idea of some of the near shore areas that we've covered in our survey program. And this next map gives you or introduces the concept of nearshore assessment zones that we've adopted relatively recently. Prior to 2015, a lot of our nearshore surveys were synoptic and were not very strategic. We were trying to deal with issue areas throughout this large water body. Now we're trying to take a more systematic approach by dividing up the nearshore areas into um, regions that can be sampled adequately by the resources that we have available. 
So you can see the different colored grids. They represent nearshore assessment zones. There's 57 of them distributed throughout the nearshore waters of Lake Huron. And each of them is about 20 to 35,000 hectares. So each of those colored areas, there's 57 of them, each of them is 20 to 35,000 hectares. For context, most of you know Lake Muskoka. Lake Muskoka is about 12,000 hectares. So each of our sampling areas is about two Muskoka lakes. And we have to cycle through 57 of them. And we have to, we, I, have to try to convince you of what's happening with nearshore fish communities in the bay, let alone the lake proper. It's a very daunting task. And we just don't have the resources to adequately sample that large area. But I thought it would be helpful to contextualize what we're up against. 20 to 35,000 hectare nearshore assessment zones that we might cover once in a decade. And then I'm supposed to get up here and tell you in a convincing <laughs> way that I know what's happening with nearshore fish communities in the lake. So that's my humility. So I'm going to focus on one of those 57 NASAs, Severn Sound. This is an area in which we've sampled the most in the near shore. Our survey extends back to 1999. We adopt a variety of netting approaches. And one of the humbling things that will come out of this analysis, you'll realize that depending on the type of survey design you have, you're going to get a different picture and impression of the near shore fish community. So one of the surveys we do is a trap netting survey, live nets, live trap nets set in the late spring. And these nets are set throughout the near shore areas and they're uh, intended to provide a cross-sectional sampling of the near shore fish community with an emphasis on post-spawning walleye. So, can anybody guess what would be the most frequently encountered fish in Severn Sound using this survey design? Any guesses? Gobies? No, unfortunately gobies swim in and out of our net. They're, they're just too small. These are fairly large mesh nets, but um, I don't know if that's surprising to anybody that long nose gar is the most abundant species in the last few years anyways. How about second? Second is a very charismatic species. Beautiful. I heard bass out there, sunfish. How about bullheads? <laughs> bullheads are the second most abundant. And then smallmouth bass. So, so we do have some sought after species that are also abundant in Severn Sound, but surprisingly, there are species that uh, most anglers and general public don't encounter that are very abundant in the waters of Severn Sound. I'm just gonna show you some summary data on the relative catch rate of three species of importance to, I guess, recreational fishers and others. Uh, Northern pike in the orange, smallmouth bass in the green, and uh, the largemouth bass in the lime green. And this is a trend through time graph. And the take-home message here is, I'm not quite sure what the take-home message here is, um, other than to say that uh, in 1999, we had very low lake levels, the onset of very low lake levels. And you can see that orange bar declining in abundance or, or height, meaning less northern pike. And that's what we saw in response to low lake levels, less recruitment of northern pike who utilize near shore coastal wetlands for successful natural reproduction. Lake levels get too low, those wetlands dry up, they're not functioning as spawning habitat. So their abundance decline, and you can see that over the years they've adjusted, and now, the last two years of sampling, their numbers are quite low. The green bar, the dark green bar, smallmouth bass, shows that that species has actually been doing quite well, even in the midst of low lake levels. And that's primarily one of the positive offshoots of climate change. Bass are benefiting from a warming trend. And they're also benefiting from the presence of round goby. 
Gobi are being used as a pre pre preferential diet item for bass. And the growing season for bass is being extended and they're reproducing that much better. They're that much larger as young of the year and they're able to survive our winters that are not as severe. So bass, in particular smallmouth bass, are doing quite well. But some of you may ask, well, what happened in 2017 and 18? Well, there's an example where now we have high lake levels. We're approaching record high lake levels. 15 minutes. And um, all I can say is this is possibly a dilution effect. Now we got more volume of water. If we have relatively the same amount of fish, their density will be that much lower. So unless you were an astute biologist and you saw all this data, it would be very difficult to tease out meaningful trends. This is just for one area. This is Severn Sound in which we have multiple years of data. Try doing this in areas where we can sample only one to two years per decade. It makes it very difficult. Moving on. So walleye. Walleye, again, a species of cultural significance, economic significance, recreational significance, spiritual significance. It's a species that um, has undergone quite a bit of change over the years, and it's one that has a fair bit of management attention paid to it. It's being affected by the changing prey base that's available in the bay, but it's also still responding to a legacy of altered habitat. This species in particular tends, tends to spawn predominantly in tributaries, river systems that drain into the bay. And their spawning habitats are very discreet. There are parts of a river where you have rapids, big boulders, rocky areas, and you need the right combination of depth, velocity, and temperature to spawn effectively. And a lot of these discrete areas, unfortunately, have been subject to alteration historically. Uh, some of them have been altered due to the construction of rail lines, roadways. Many of you out there, none of you out there would remember the log drives that occurred in the early 1900s through to the early 1930s, 1940s. Those log drives decimated river channels. They totally altered habitat features that were important for this species. So we're still trying to understand what the carrying capacity for walleye is under the current conditions. So I'm just going to highlight some information from spawning walleye in Port Severn, Severn Sound area. There's still a spawning run of walleye there. It's quite susceptible to overharvest from a variety of sources and the number of walleye that appear each year is variable. And a lot of that is a result of their reproductive output. It's quite variable. Year class production in walleye is not consistent. And they need the right combination of factors to produce a, a successful year class. And unfortunately, unfortunately, in the last decade, because of changing thermal regimes, because of changing water levels and discharge of the watersheds, these conditions are translating into poor year class production of walleye. So some of you may have heard about the phenomenon of a lot of our watersheds are becoming more flashy. The rain events are more intense. Our snowpack isn't as uh, large and stable as it has been in the past. So these fish are spring spawners and they need a consistent flow regime and they need access to appropriate substrate and they need the right thermal regime in order to reproduce successfully. And that hasn't been happening on a regular basis in recent years. I'm going to move on to another survey design and this is a broad scale monitoring design. It's used in the summer. It's multi, it's a stratified index netting program and it's sampling the near shore and mid offshore fish community. So it gives us another perspective on what's happening in the fish community. And it's a provincially standardized survey design. We've sampled 10 NASAs to date. You can see that uh, inset map on the right-hand side. There's a fair bit of coverage that we've been able to uh, uh, 
uh, do over the last few years. And the insights we gained from this survey reflect the composition of the fish community. And you can see that in this survey design, yellow perch are the most prominent numerically, smallmouth bass are the second most abundant, and northern pike are third. So a little different from the trap net results. And you can see that there's a fair bit of diversity of species on uh, the left-hand side there. Um, no, the right-hand side. I'm getting confused. So the right-hand side, so we still have a lot of diversity of species in the near shore. And so that's one positive. So we still have a lot of biodiversity in the near shore fish communities. But there are some species that are still suffering from the variability in ecological conditions. This is some information we're able to um, tease out of our uh, broad scale monitoring uh, program. Biological reference points for this species, walleye. The BSM survey design is applied to inland lakes across the province. So we can look at our performance measures and compare them provincially to a large database that's been set up. And I've just chosen one of the uh, metrics, one of the reference points, and that is the relative abundance of walleye per net set. So the amount of walleye that are caught per net set. And the various shading that you see on that graph, red is not good, yellow is medium, green is good. So I don't think I have to describe the take home message from this graph. Walleye are not doing well in our waters. Um, with a few exceptions, Key River possibly, the Spanish River. This is looking at all age classes, so this is not a spawning run, this is age classes across the population. And basically, what we're seeing is lack of recruitment, still lots of harvest pressure on walleye, so there's still a lot of exploitation. There are additional exploitation sources such as cormorants, I was going to avoid cormorants in my presentation, but I just thought I'd throw it in there just to be provocative. So there are a lot of things that are contributing to a high mortality rate of walleye. And I mentioned that historic legacy as well, habitat alteration. So walleye are not doing very well currently in the bay. And we're embarking on an initiative to develop a walleye management plan to find out what are the best possible solutions moving forward to increase walleye abundance. Did I see that 10 minute? Yeah. yeah. You, I did? I didn't even notice it. Okay, so small fish population assessment. Another survey designed to look at the small bodied fish, the minnow species in the near shore. This is just an example of some of the areas that we have surveyed, Midland Bay, uh, Brit, Owen Sound, Blackstone Harbor. We've actually got 12 locations that we surveyed and have surveyed over the last 10 years. And as I'm going to show you, the results, some of the results that you can get from the survey is family representation in these fish communities. And what you can hopefully clearly see is that depending on where you are in the bay, your fish community, when it relates to small fish, is quite variable. It's very different depending on where you are. For instance, Owen Sound is dominated by round goby. Some may ask why. Well, it's a very altered nearshore habitat. A lot of hard shoreline, not a lot of species diversity. Midland Bay is dominated by minnow species, and to a lesser extent, perch. So this graph just gives you an idea how variable fish communities and small fish representation is across the bay. This is kind of a complicated graph to put near the end of my talk, but I thought, I'm gonna throw it in anyways. So the middle of the two graphs that you see there are sites in Georgia Bay. And this probability of interspecific encounter is a measure of biodiversity. So if the probability of you encountering someone different is high, then it's likely that there's more biodiversity in that location. However, if all you encounter is your clone, then the biodiversity is very low. So if you're above that midline, 
your biodiversity is relatively good. And you can see that it's kind of all over the map, even for Georgian Bay. There's some locations like Midland Bay that looking at the gillnet catches, biodiversity is quite low. That's because it's dominated by yellow perch, young yellow perch. But then if you look at the fight nets, the biodiversity measure there is actually not too bad because those nets are set in shallow wetland type areas where you have more diversity. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, it's complicated. Fish communities are very dynamic and quite variable. I'm just going to end up by talking about a species that is of significance to me and possibly to others, the muscalunge. It's a very unique part of the biodiversity in the bay. In fact, the bay supports the largest contiguous population of the species across the Great Lakes. And many of you may ask, why is that? It's because we have intact, functioning, coastal wetlands that have not been altered to a significant ex extent to diminish their functional capacity. You can look across the Great Lakes where that does not exist. A lot of wetlands have been destroyed and filled in and altered. So we're lucky in Georgian Bay that we can still support this magnificent creature because of the coastal wetlands. This is just highlighting some of the areas that we've done some netting surveys in recent years the uh, muscalunch are successfully spawning in the Severn Sound area, particularly where there's an abundance of coastal wetlands. But these wetlands are vulnerable, particularly in Severn Sound, where they are found in close proximity to cottage areas, developed shoreline areas, and they're also very susceptible to lower lake levels. When we had that period of low lake level up until recently, there's very little evidence of successful recruitment of muscalunge in this part of the bay because those wetlands were high and dry and they were not functioning properly. We've had a collaboration, a partnership with McMaster University that has enabled us to gain insights about the significance of coastal wetlands, not only for apex predators like the muscalunge, but for a variety of fish species and uh, I'm sure this presentation will be made available for those of you who want to really dive deep into musky ecology and fish community ecology and coastal wetlands, you can uh, take a look at some of these papers that have been published recently. So, in conclusion, and I'm on time, amazing. So, fish communities in Georgian Bay are changing for a variety of reasons. I don't really have time to expand upon those right now, do I? <laughs> Offshore and nearshore fish community dynamics are complex. It's the scale of the system. It's the ecological changes that have occurred and continue to occur. Did I talk about climate change and all this? Invasive species have dramatically changed population dynamics, especially in offshore waters. It's the offshore waters that have shown and manifested these ecological changes uh, most extensively. The cumulative effects of invasive species, habitat alteration, harvest, and climate change make future predictions difficult. It's very difficult for me, as a management biologist with close to 30 years of experience, to give you some indication of what's going to happen in the next five years. I have no idea. I know that we've retained a lot of the essential components of a healthy ecosystem in the bay, those parts are still there for the most part. If you look at other Great Lakes, particularly the lower Great Lakes, they've lost a lot of the pieces, especially when it relates to habitat. We still have the habitat. However, should I mention Asian carp? Why would I do that? Why would I do that and complicate things so much? Grass carp are reproducing in Lake Erie. Grass carp decimate coastal wetlands. And if I haven't overemphasized the significance of coastal wetlands in Georgian Bay, I'll do that now. If that species makes its way into the bay, those coastal wetlands that are responsible for the biodiversity that we see right now 
will be in jeopardy. And with that note, I'll uh, <laughs> conclude my presentation. Thanks. We do have time for a question or two. Um, and first up is David Sweden. So. I just have one question. Um, either you or me both. But the, the diaphragm chart that you showed up, first of all, thank you. In 2017, it finally shows for today. Yeah. I think that was preliminary, though. Okay. <laughs> oh. I will defer that question to Bo. So I think, yeah, that's very preliminary. They kind of backed off the diaphragm. So I, we can't do that. So yeah, just thank you. I'll take that out of the talk. <laughs> Give it extra. <laughs> uh, anybody else for uh, for question for Arunas? All right. Thanks again. Thanks. We appreciate it. Uh, can you switch over for me, yep. Terrence? Thanks. I'll just manage yep. to screw it. Up. Um, we've been really fortunate as the Jordan Bay Bias Reserve to uh, have Shawnee First Nation share a lot of their, their knowledge and their experiences with us. Uh, this past spring, um, we were invited out uh, onto the water uh, with them. To, to learn about their walleye program. And uh, our next speaker, Aaron uh, Pemejewong, was, uh, was one of our guides and one of our uh, teachers that day. Um, and so I'm delighted to have him uh, present today uh, on, on the program that's happening at Shawnee First Nation. It's really, quite, it's really quite remarkable what's going on there. So Aaron is uh, a member of Shawnee First Nations. He's been employed as a hatchery operator uh, by the First Nations since the spring of 2017. Um, watching him share his knowledge uh, with us uh, and with the youth in the program uh, out there has been, has been a real treat. So Aaron, thank you for coming today. Good afternoon. <clears throat> I'd like to uh, thank Georgia Bay Biosphere for inviting me here. Um, I'm here to talk about the hatchery program, uh, which I've um, worked for for the last couple of years. Um, on, uh, on a historical note, I'd just like to say that um, my grandfather worked with uh, MNR on this um, on this river uh, back in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, my father also um, worked on some projects on this um, <clears throat> on this river, and now I'm working here. So it's uh, kind of like a family thing going on, which is cool. <laughs> um, So this is just a shot of Shawanga River Basin uh, the winter um, January. So that's just a cool shot. Um, so what we teach here is uh, based on the seven grandfather teachings, um, truth, respect, humility, honesty, courage, love, and wisdom. So um, we teach that, we learn that when we're at a young age and um, our, our First Nation um, as a people, this is our natural law. This is what we believe in, and uh, mm -hmm. this is how we go as um, um, as our natural law. And um, thank you. Um, yeah. So we we govern ourselves on this, and um, that's how we see ourselves as um, as uh, stewards of the land. 
Um, I got a nice little, here's a, a look under underwater of the walleye. Um, this is, a, it looks to be a, three healthy uh, females, so you can see they're full of eggs. Uh, kind of hard to see in the bottom, but there's uh, there's some eggs in the front there, on the right. <laughs> I left, right, sorry. Um, yeah, I'm just having a little time here. <clears throat> but yeah, so we have some uh, equipment that gets us to uh, see underwater and have a look at uh, eggs mm. and um, the fish. And um, this next uh, video is a little graphic, but um, it shows um, how we harvest fish and how we adapt it to uh, utilize newer technologies like uh, metal spears and stuff like that. So, uh, anyway. Um, so here, this is um, one of our monitors. They're set up our GoPro camera, and this is how we um, we harvest our fish for uh, subsidence, for ceremonies, uh, for our powwows, for naming ceremonies and stuff like that. So it's not for sport. It's we don't do it to maim the fish. We want to um, tr harvest them traditionally, and this is how we do it. Um, it's it's. Uh, if you look on to the left side there, you can see um, a still shot of uh, the population of, of walleye in Schwanaga River. Um, that's, uh, early, that's the early um, spring shot. Um, I think that was uh, April 26th, I think, or something like that. But uh, that's, that's what they look like, the fish when they're in there. Um, next up, um, we take our our um, school children out and we harvest them, um, show them the harvesting traditionally, traditionally, but we also instill all of our, um, our grandfather teachings and, um, and uh, we will, um, with, the, with the hatchery, we will uh, show them, uh, we will demonstrate um, the fertilization of the eggs. Um, we will demonstrate how to flay fish. We will show them the data that we collect uh, for the monitors, you'll see the one guy in the orange hat, he's a uh, monitor. Um, he, he ate, um, I'll get in a little bit more of that later. Um, so we also have, um, on uh, May 16th, it says here, we went out to, uh, had a river outing. Um, we had uh, the chief council, uh, First Nation staff, school, our school, and um, invited visitors. Um, we had um, Naywash and Saugeen. Um, um, visitors come and uh, uh, there was a couple other things that we had built uh, this year which was uh, a deck for our elders to sit so when they come and visit the river they'll be nice and comfortable and that will also help us to get um, get our our young children and our elders to communicate with each other so then that way there's not you no know, loss of knowledge and that knowledge is passed on to our, our young people. Um, and when, we are, uh, when we're out visiting, um, we get a shore lunch, which is great. Um, we have scone, potatoes, beans, um, freshly caught fish, which is uh, cooked up by uh, my uncle. He's an elder and a fishing guide, so he cooks up shore lunches all the time. It's good. Um, so yeah, everybody, everybody gets to have a good bite to eat. Um, Next up, uh, here's um, here are our, our incubation jars. Um, this one in the forefront um, has approximately uh, three liters in there, which will hold again pro approximately. Somebody figured this number out, but I never did. Uh, there's about three hundred thirty thousand eggs in that first jar in the front. Um, so typically, we'll have um, anywhere from five five to ten jars going at one time. Um, the one on the back is half, so that's you know, 165,000 eggs or so, um, which is pretty good. Um, this is a video of the fry hatching. Um, what we do is uh, we will um, either hatch them out right into our creek right beside it, or we will, we will capture them and take them back to the river which where they came from so we'll uh, make sure that um, we try to restock what we've taken and we harvest over the spawning season or what harvest season. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, so river monitoring, we will we will hire um, we will hire eight to ten um, members from Shawanaga, and what they will do is they will they will collect data. They will collect uh, length, um, weight, um, sex, the time of time of day, and um, <clears throat> they will write that all down. And we have a couple of years of data, so I'm just working on crunching all that stuff up. Um, We'll, they will also uh, take part in um, the egg fertilization and the process of getting the eggs to uh, back to the hatchery. Um, they also have other uh, duties. Um, our First Nation has taken upon itself to do a monitorium of uh, the fish that are allowed to be harvested. So what happens is uh, um, members are able to harvest three fish Per household per day so that uh, keeps numbers down on how many fish that we actually harvest per year so those numbers are are um, calculated in with the monitoring and the monitors also educate people that come for visiting and stuff um, that's a couple of uh, some information on last year's harvest um, our average weight was uh, 3.5 pounds, and the average length was 21.1 inches. Um, our total, our total harvest for the full all first the all First Nation members for the the whole season was 836 fish. 486 were female, 350 were were male. Um, it was uh, over the whole average of 25 days. Um, it was 27 fish per day, which um, in the grand scheme of things, I don't think is very many fish. For, uh, but there's other, um, you know, pressures from recreational and um, commercial fisheries. <clears throat> and um, yeah, the Jimmy goes. We do have time for questions for Aaron, oh, yeah. if he's willing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, if, are there any questions uh, from the audience? I think, oh, at the back. Adam. Thanks, Aaron. I'm just curious if you could share how much people got for the year Oh, yeah. Um, uh, this year our number was uh, a little lower than um, what we um, usually our averages, uh, we put back, uh, we put back 914,000 fry. Um, last year uh, was uh, 1.3 million, and um, our high has our highest in 2013, I think I want to say, uh, was uh, 5 million. So uh, within over the few years, our average has been about 1.5 million fry per um, season. Anybody else? Um, as far as I know, right now um, it's unique uh, to Shawanaga. Um, and there has been um, several First Nations that approached uh, um, myself and Stan on how how we started up and how we can help them. Um, start one of their hatcheries too. So it's, um, it's something that people have been looking to work on, work towards to help uh, rehabilitate their, their fisheries and uh, their rivers. One more. Yep. Um, how did you come up with the level of catch in the community? Um, uh, I believe it went to, uh, uh, band council. Um, um, it also got put out there into the community, and they just compiled all of the data and or, or all the and uh, just came up with that number, which was um, three fish per day. So. Thanks so much. Yep. Yeah, appreciate um, it. Oh. Yes. Uh, 
Let me get this hit. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, there has been a, a noticeable number of, of walleye um, <clears throat> where we put them back into the creek right beside our, our hatchery. There's been numbers uh, increasing there. Um, but uh, the ones that we put back into uh, Swanaga River, uh, I believe that it's, it's stable. Uh, it's, I haven't seen no increase or decrease, but uh, those are just numbers that I don't really have. Uh, I believe that Aaron will be around for a while. Uh, if, there, if there are more questions uh, f for him. And, okay. So we're into our, we're into our last round of, uh, of, of table chats. And I believe that David is going around with the, the next uh, set of questions. And again, just to remind you, uh, so I think it's important, a few people have asked me around how, uh, how do they have an impact into these kind of direction, the directions that are being taken, the research and monitoring uh, directions that are being taken by the federal and provincial governments and other NGOs and university researchers. And it is through this effort. So what we will again be doing is we'll be taking this information, compiling it into a summary, and we'll present that uh, forward uh, as, a, as a, a sort of a report from uh, this, this group of uh, community, and uh, then what we will do is we'll track how it's had an influence into uh, the directions of the research uh, and monitoring and see in terms of the recommendations that they put forward. Uh, and all of that is because we're curious to see how the scientists and the researchers respond to this data, um, and, and it'll go back and forth. So that, that is the way, that this is valuable information for them to know whether indeed uh, you, what they're doing is, is meeting with your needs and desires and concerns, um, and it highlights uh, a lot of good information for them. So, in your, again, we're back to this. We have, if uh, David could help me on the computer over here, uh, we have a set of priorities that have been put forward and recommended uh, based on the research uh, findings of the past couple of years. Uh, you may have more to add. Uh, we'll get it up to here shortly when we get Katrina back up with her computer. Hey, Katrina, we need your password. Um, so, uh, so if you can fill out your own form, but also have a table conversation. Again, we might need to amalgamate uh, tables uh, yet again, uh, but please, please do that. Um, really quick one is that the, the findings that have kind of helped to build into this can be found on the State of the Bay website. Uh, we are going to be seeking permission from the presenters uh, to have uh, their presentations available through the website or uh, if it's on their own websites, links to their, their home website so you'll be able to follow through and get the information uh, if you want to see those. Um, and then the other one is just a reminder from uh, this morning uh, when there was the water lifting ceremonies that uh, Dina, uh, oh, I, I can't do it this late game. Uh, Dina <laughs> had invited us to uh, have, a, have a drink of the, of the water uh, from the ceremony, um, and, and she'll be returning shortly. I think she's here <laughs> um, uh, to help us close out the, the day in a good way. So um, have your conversations. Uh, there are a number of fisheries experts in the room that can circulate and help you out. So if you have any questions, raise your hand. has offered to uh, close out the day uh, in, a, in a good way. I'm going to ask if the folks at the back could come forward uh, for this, just to, to get up and, and come a little bit closer. That would be, uh, that would be great uh, for me. Um, and I, I think once Dina has uh, com completed her closing, uh, you're, you're not going to hear from me again. So uh, miigwech and thanks. <laughs> They go, <coughs> which that means thank you. That means I'm, I'm done. Anyway, that's a joke uh, in the Shabbos uh, way. But anyway, this song I'm sending out to you, I'm not just sending it out to you that you have a safe trip home, 
whether you're just going down the road or you're traveling many miles, but it's also to acknowledge those ones that took care of our homes or took care of our children or our grandchildren or just took care of, or, of the day for us so that we could be here in some capacity. We always acknowledge those ones because we're here because of them. And I know that they sent their thoughts and their spirit here to be, to be here uh, with us today. So, um, and then the end part of my song talks about all those ones that went on before us. They've gone to that spirit world, but before they did that, they left beautiful bundles here that we picked up, whether it was kindness, whether it was respect, whether it was taking care of our Mother Earth or taking care of each other. They left bundles here for us to pick up, and that's what we're doing, so we're going to acknowledge them. And you can stand up and you can tap. Um, I never drum and just stay still. And usually I have a whole bunch of girls here backing me up. I don't usually sing by myself. <laughs> but my, my little girls are, are um, been doing a lot of events lately, so you're stuck with me. 